Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lorraine Ellery. Uh, thank you for coming and listening to my presentation. I'm going to talk to you today about the challenges of outsourcing. Um, my findings are based on some interviews that I've conducted with um, experienced uh, scholarly publishing professionals in 2016 um, who have experience in outsourcing uh, their services, including their peer review systems, uh, maybe their, their apps, their CRM systems, but a lot of them I spoke to were talking about their, their technology platforms. So let's consider what the key drivers are for organisations that can lead to outsourcing. So the key reason for outsourcing for the first time can be a strategic one, based around where you wish to continue to invest your time and money, and if you already have, or not necessarily um, have internally, the resource uh, in-house uh, and the expertise to provide a quality service to your internal and external stakeholders, you may still decide that there are strong competitor advantages to developing your own custom solution. However, in weighing up the pros and the cons, you may decide that it makes sense for your organisation to focus your time and effort on your core business and therefore will seek a trusted partner that you expect to deliver cost-effective, quality, scalable and timely services. Now, the potential that changes in technology can provide will prompt a, a review of previous decisions. So, you may need to rework your platform rework your strategy, remain flexible and invest in APIs uh, and open technologies to create new opportunities. So it's no longer necessary to, to host all of your content on one platform, as independent silos and systems can be integrated and meaningful content uh, relationships created. However, if you've already invested heavily uh, and uh, are happy with your current supplier, then um, several publishers that I've spoken to have suggested that despite the advantages that technology um, may bring, there's an opportunity cost to first consider. When you've actually already settled uh, on outsourcing a service, you may find that players in the space change over time. New entrants uh, come into the market or there are other approaches to now consider. And this can lead to um, review that space and the cost of moving suppliers as an a sensible thing to do on a regular basis. So consider uh, whether you have enough experts in your organisation that can cover everything at once. Sometimes it's not just a cost-based issue, but how much change you can manage, in how many places and how many resources you have internally from an expertise perspective. The lack of availability of resource is a key driver uh, when reaching a conclusion to outsource particularly if you are uh, heavily involved in, say, a, a large in-house platform project, uh, as this publisher show was at the time. So, forced to move. Well, the verdict to review and select a new supplier can sometimes be forced upon an organisation. So, for example, um, through mergers and acquisitions. The time constraints associated to implementing changes in policy or the undertaking of an acquisition can provide huge challenges. The planning normally uh, invested in the process of outsourcing is dictated by the situation uh, rather than by you and more often than not will come at a time when not all stakeholders are available to actually provide their input into the strategic and tactical decisions that need to be agreed before deciding uh, to enter into the process of evaluating and selecting a new partner. Now, if there are signs that a supplier is becoming unstable, it's a good business practice to undertake due diligence, to ensure you're informed about the issues concerned and are fully aware of the options available to you in the event you need to renegotiate or exit your contract. You may decide to review your options if you increasingly find that your supplier is no longer in tune with your business goals or maybe uh, they're unable to communicate effectively with you, or unwilling to consider some of your requests, or not delivering the, the agreed service level in the first place. So the supplier may no longer offer an appropriate value proposition. They may even um, fail to make um, uh, good on the promises that they've made. Um, 
a combination or even just one of these scenarios is, is really challenging and, and may even lead to a breakdown uh, in relationships and it's not always recovered. You may have a partnership with your current supplier for say a number of years and would like to ensure that you're aware of what the competitors are offering so that you can be confident that you continue to receive uh, value for money. Many organisations will have a company policy in place to ensure that there's a constant review of all suppliers and services they provide. Now this may not happen uh, every year or even um, uh, every uh, two to three years, um, but, it, but it can be you know, up to five years before these reviews take place. But it really does depend on the complexity of the service offering and the organisation's internal policy. Now many decisions are usually motivated by the desire to ensure you're offering a good service to your customer. And in one example, a publisher um, I was speaking to was tasked with looking at their publishing setup, uh, the systems and processes they were using currently and over time. And this was with the main objective to consider how these would be more effective and how the organisation could have a better service uh, for their authors and reviewers. So once they went through this process, the board approved the recommendations. They reached uh, an agreement to look at their peer review systems, uh, in this case, uh, their production systems and other related services uh, was reached. Now you may actually decide to continue holding on to the reins and actually not outsource at all. Uh, in fact, you may want to develop your services in-house and you may decide that uh, to insource additional skills and technology components by partnering with specialists um, uh, in their field rather than outsourcing allows you to develop a hybrid solution and, and to share the cost of ongoing development for your service offering with a chosen partner. So what level of engagement should uh, we have with our stakeholders? So one organisation I spoke to were lucky enough to have a specialist qualified procurement team in place um, and they were reported to the Director of uh, Operations. The team uh, are responsible for all contracts with a value through its lifetime of over £150,000 uh, or more. Uh, and it includes everything in terms of production work, including the typesetting and printing. However, uh, engagement of outsourcing as a service hasn't always been managed in this way and um, started actually with just one person, albeit someone who came to the organisation with the, the knowledge and skills of working um, within the industry with both in offshore uh, and um, onshore suppliers. So you wind forward a few years and now with the contracts for all suppliers and best practice from start to end in place, the organisation has certainly seen the benefit of having the process formalised, even if they're uh, on occasions where um, they were being questioned and challenged about the actual cost of doing this. So many organisations will not have the benefit of a dedicated procurement team. Uh, and instead will utilise the members of relevant departments or actually create a new temporary cross-departmental um, team uh, to manage the process. So the de decision making um, amongst those that uh, I spoke to actually uh, varied and this was dependent on the complexity of the required outsourced service that we were talking about uh, and some teams uh, had the relevant skills and resource to reach a decision uh, without having to um, reach out to others in their organisations. And others had clear policies in place to ensure the decision is overseen by um, a committee or managed um, team or, or both. So although the final decision may have actually been undertaken by a smaller group, the input from start to finish was usually widely sought. Accountability is of course important as despite good intentions and best laid plans to ensure that a partnership is successful, there is always risk that things don't actually go to plan. And it's therefore important to ensure that internal stakeholders outside your team are approached early uh, and invited to input their thoughts and provide feedback uh, as these individuals are then more likely to support your decisions uh, in moving forward. So in, in, in actually obtaining buy-in <clears throat> Uh, from others uh, will allow you not only to share the product's, uh, project's success but also the accountability in the event of any problems that um, happen down the line. So reducing the risk uh, of receiving comments such as Yvonne you just asked me earlier. Um, uh, and obviously that's usually when it's too late to do anything about it. So the feedback that derives from engagement um, 
also helps with considering if you've taken all the risks into account uh, and to stop and ask if you're making the right decisions. So ask yourself, who can you, um, who are your partners in crime within your organisation and, and who would you consider which, you know, which departments would you not want to work with? Some say to me, for example, the finance team wouldn't be a, the right department to uh, include in these type of discussions. So one um, platform manager I spoke to took a really uh, a unique um, and possibly a risky approach when it came to uh, external engagement, which worked in his favour. The manager was approached by a scholarly publishing organisation committee who was looking for a, a keynote speaker for a conference with a theme based around how to manage different content types. And the manager had a solution, a, a vision, uh, for their own organisation that had continued to develop into a wider vision in parallel with uh, an RFP process or request for proposal that was actually um, being undertaken at that time and this was for their platform. Now the manager, um, well sorry, the keynote presentation took place before this vision had been fully approved, uh, approved internally uh, within their organisation. Um, but through the positive comments that he received from the delegates that attended the event, uh, and those comments actually directly reached the organisation's management team. Although I said this was a risky approach, it actually paid off because, uh, and one, it certainly was a decision they didn't regret because subsequently the internal buy-in was significantly supported by the external buy-in generated by the industry delegates present. And some of you may recognise who that might be. So um, anyway, I asked those who, who, in, um, who I interviewed about the level of engagement with their communities and customers during the outsourcing process. And the response was quite mixed actually, and some key factors for consideration emerged. So firstly, it was whether or not uh, people felt actually attached to the system uh, or not. Uh, and the quality of feedback is more likely if people uh, feel an attachment to the system. Attachment for the system is less likely for production systems than it is for peer review uh, or posting uh, solutions. So for example, editorial board members may have to interact with the system on a regular basis, acting as uh, academic editors, as well as overseeing the peer review process. And the authors, of course, will also have a lot of experience using various systems too. So the same is true with hosting platforms. Even though people may not realise their experience in them, they often have strong views about how they should look. Uh, and how they should see things and how they should be presented online. Secondly, um, there may be concerns over alerting customers to change. So some publishers express that although they engage with their customers throughout the year, they've not necessarily uh, engaged with them before a decision to change uh, their suppliers were made and in some instances not even until after the implementation. So they felt that through the ongoing continuous engagement they will already have built up, um, they, they gained a good picture uh, over that time to the customer's requirements and, and do not see the need to alert them uh, and risk any cause for unnecessary concern. Now thirdly, um, you may ask whether the supplier is actually set up to engage with the customer directly. We all know that the customer is a, a critical partner and large publishers are likely to have user groups, focus groups, advisory boards in place to support ongoing engagement and, and customer, with their customers throughout the year. However, that's not necessarily the same for some of the smaller publishers uh, that I've spoken to. And they don't necessarily have these forums in place yet. And therefore, um, one experience by a publisher who uh, I interviewed was found it really beneficial that the suppliers that he was working with had the ability to engage the customers directly on their behalf uh, and provide feedback on their systems. And finally, um, some publishers decide that it's only good to engage with their clients uh, when, when they have a select group of customers that they feel um, can give them the quality feedback that, that they require. Uh, and basically they're taking the middle ground really and um, they obtain this um, feedback from this select group uh, of customers and they know that they can rely on that feedback. So quite mixed opinions. So the aim now when outsourcing is to establish a long-term partnership. So when you're forging relationships early, um, that's when you know, you're looking to outsource. It's a good idea to do this because the more suppliers you're speaking to that you already have relationships in place with, the better. 
Suppliers may develop new technologies um, from strategic partnerships to provide a better solution, so it's also important to keep abreast of de developments, understand the competitor landscape and what options are available to you, even outside your own industry. Communication is much improved if you match relationships at various levels within the organisation, both at the supplier and your own organisation. And feedback will really help the supplier develop their solution further, and it's important at all stages of discussions. So now we move on to talking a little bit about the, um, uh, the proposal stage, uh, where you're actually reaching out uh, with an RFP, for example, or a tender process, and the evaluation that transpires. Now, a bit limited on time here, so I'm not going to go through uh, all of these, but here are some of the um, impressions that some of the people that I spoke to had of suppliers, or some of the questions at least, that uh, they would ask. And, uh, Know, whether or not this supplier actually has a track record already um, working with uh, similar organisations to yourself. Where are they actually based? Are they able to communicate with you in your own language? There's a lot of uh, issues and challenges that can arrange uh, working with offshore partners. Most importantly though, can they actually understand your business? And do bear in mind that things can change quite quickly, so you do need to keep a, uh, an eye out as to whether uh, you're current supplier or your prospective supplier is actually stable. A head of a journal programme from a large uh, medical society um, publisher in the US um, that completed several transitions to new vendor sites uh, this year said, and I quote, quote, publishers and the selected vendor should agree to a statement of work and in great detail. So what will be delivered and when with the compensation uh, when with compensation or penalties for non-delivery. This is especially important for key workflow processes and functionalities. Ideally, the consultant and client staff should document or record meetings with vendors during the RFP process and make sure that all partners, uh, all parties are in agreement of what was presented and discussed to minimise disagreements and differences in interpretation at different at, at agreement and transition stage. I also spoke to another publisher, Caroline Burley, from um, the Royal Society of Chemistry. And she said that suppliers may say, yes, we can do that straight away, uh, without actually taking the time to fully understand what it is they're actually asking them to do. And so to documentate this um, conversation uh, uh, and to ensure that they fully appreciate their requirements uh, they make uh, is very important. So if everyone is clear on the expectations and are in agreement, then you should be able to work with suppliers to agree a realistic timeline to deliver the service. If they're not clear on what they're asking uh, them to do, they may have to do additional last minute work that they were not anticipating, which may affect the delivery time. Or if as the customer you are pushing for a fast delivery, it may be the case that they can't do all the paper, uh, preparative work before you go live. So you may need to be accommodating in terms of what you expect of the new supplier if you have a tight deadline, but be aware that this may cause longer term problems once the motivation to finish the preparative work is removed. Some quotes here, one from, um, well, a couple here on the left from Helen King, who's the digital strategy leader at BMJ, uh, and to the right there from um, Matt uh, from Mark Allen Group. The first quote though, involvement of technical person earlier in the discussion provides continuity and I can certainly relate to that because being a business development director working for uh, platform uh, technology partners in the past, um, I know through my own experience that if you're able to bring a technical person into the discussion earlier on with the client, um, there's usually a greater uh, transparency and understanding of what the requirement is that can actually follow through to delivery. So working with a potential supplier to test their services before you decide to move the platform can provide you with a large amount of quality of information about the service. And if it will be a good fit, and this is something else that Helen King from BMJ told me about, it's an example of something they actually did with a platform trial. I also spoke to Jeremy McDonald, who's the Director of Technology at Pharmaceutical Press, and he talked about the multiple internal challenges that arise when trying to present data that needs to be clinically correct. And people are using data to make important decisions, of course, about other people, including children. So 
there's a high level of responsibility for you as the publisher to get it right. And when developing an app, you're, you're having to create your content set into a different media. So to ensure quality uh, assessment has been undertaken before presenting the data. He also then went on to talk about the, um, the challenges and the differences with different versions of uh, iOS, for example. In talking with Simon Lawrenson, who's the operations manager for Bioscientifica, uh, about the switch to a new e-commerce e uh, supplier, Simon shared some helpful advice. He said that it's important to speak to other publishers and get as much advice as you can. With lots of society-owned publishers his size, they were able uh, to have the opportunity to exchange notes. Um, however, he did offer a word of caution. When talking to another publisher, they actually may be um, being optimistic uh, at times uh, when they're speaking to you. So don't you know, take things with a pinch of salt. I think consider time and resources is a key one. I've got a quote here from Daniel Smith, who's the previously the head of academic publishing at, at the IAT, uh, and is now a semi-retired publisher and a consultant as well. Daniel also discussed hosting services, and he said that a properly formulated project plan would allow at least six to 12 months of post-implementation activity to ensure that the service is fit for purpose. And where it is not, uh, there is time and resource to put it right. So there's a lot to say for relationships um, that is a positive one. And there's a comment here from a leading UK society publisher. Ove Kale, uh, Director of Product Manager and Global Distribution at Brill, um, was speaking to me in regards to um, proposals that he received from vendors uh, and uh, when he was looking to uh, outsource his uh, technology platform. And I'll quote him, he said, we didn't expect to get responses back that were close to 150 pages long. And also the diversity of proposals and different aspects of pricing made it difficult to, to compare them. So we tried to prevent this providing vendors with uh, the Excel version uh, of our requirements and even though they filled in the sheet and highlighted what was uh, in scope and what wasn't, it was still a challenge to get a good, easy overview of how the proposals compare. So expect the unexpected. And there are key challenges um, that I'm going to list here that some of these publishers have over uh, undertaken. We've already talked about the misunderstanding uh, and incorrect interpretation. There's also the loss of momentum in a project as well. And this is usually due to timing and who's available to keep the project moving forward. You have to be careful of escalating costs, of course. It's also good to get some visibility into what the ongoing costs may be. And one of the main issues uh, that publishers that I spoke to found was those that actually didn't know um, what they didn't know and so yeah the costs are going to come later down the line so it's trying to get as much visibility as possible which is is quite challenging and we can talk more about these in, in detail and i'm writing some more blog posts on this topic so i'll expand on on this area reg regarding the challenges but i do want to share with you some of the, the key recommendations so if you're happy um one of the publishers I spoke to said, don't spend time going out to RFP. Consider the opportunity costs involved. They also said, take the emotion out uh, uh, of, of the decision. Ensure you're agreeing a clear criteria. Do shop around and look for more creative solutions for your problems and uh, maybe outside of your industry too. Try before you buy. This is one of the examples that Helen King from BMJ uh, suggested um, worked for them. <clears throat> Obtain references, ask for feed feedback from, from different roles uh, within the organisation that deal with the supplier, um, including those that deal with the day-to-day -day communications. And collaborate with consultants to help distill information and, and facilitate discussions uh, to allow stakeholders to talk through their frustrations. And this can strengthen the, the value of the final offering. 
Now be realistic with your timelines. If you have to change a supplier at short notice, you need to be accommodating in terms of what you expect of the new supplier. So if you're pushing a tight deadline on them, you need to be aware that this may cause longer term problems. Ask suppliers for feedback on the RFP process for their, from their perspective too. So what other questions could have been asked, for example? Ask for feedback from the clients, obtain feedback from the supplier's existing clients and how their transition went and their current experience. And do plan for the unexpected as everything can stop for Christmas as one supplier suggested. This is a project manager looking pretty frustrated. So happy holidays everyone, thank you for listening.